A ringing phone on the final day of the year hides an evil plan of a husband's insatiable greed for his wife's millions, a plan that will send shivers down your spine. On the final day of the year, even the bustling city of New York was no exception. Morning had just arrived, casting a faint glow over one of Manhattan's police stations. Amidst sips of coffee and the aroma of fresh donuts, officers were engaged in spirited conversations about their impending New Year's Eve festivities, a cherished tradition for New Yorkers. However, the air of celebration swiftly evaporated when a ringing phone disrupted the jovial atmosphere. The call was swiftly forwarded, connecting them with a distraction man on the other end. At precisely 7.20 a.m., Rod Colvin, a resident of the Upper West Side, was on the line, his voice trembling with panic and emotions that obscured his words. It took some effort to soothe him, but as the tension ebbed away, the police officers began to grasp the reason behind his anxious call. Rod, upon entering the bathroom of his separated wife Sheila Colvin's apartment, noticed the bathtub full of water, but what immediately sent a chill down his spine was the unmistakable red color of the water, indicating that blood was mixed in. As he approached, he noticed his wife at the bottom of the bathtub, and wasted no time pulling her out of the water to prevent her from drowning. The first operator he spoke to on the phone immediately instructed him on the reanimation procedure to follow when an unconscious person is discovered. However, his efforts proved to be in vain as Shield's body was already cold and rigid, indicating that she was beyond help. While waiting for the first officers to arrive, Rod covered his wife's body with a blanket he found nearby. A few minutes later, law enforcement arrived at the location in the heart of Manhattan. Clearly, this was a luxury residence located less than 500 meters from Central Park. When the police officers arrived at the door, they already had a vague idea of the events that may have occurred there. Despite New York's sparkling appearance, the truth was that it could be a particularly stressful city. Accidents or individuals deciding to end their lives were unfortunately all too common for police officers accustomed to such incidents, even in luxury buildings. The fact that the West Side apartment was one of the safest areas in Manhattan supported the assumption of a non-suspicious death. Of course, before drawing a definitive conclusion, they had to enter the apartment to verify what the police officers had in mind. So, the investigators entered the residence, heading towards the bathroom where Sheil's body was covered by the blanket her husband had placed over her. Her lifeless body lay next to the bathtub, the water still tinged with a reddish hue. There was some on the floor as well, which was not surprising since Rod had removed his wife from the bath. The investigators noticed that blood was flowing from the back of the woman's head, dripping onto the bathroom tiles. They also observed that the door of one of the cabinets in the room was open. Upon closer examination, they saw that the top hinge of the cabinet door was torn off, with the door now held in place only by the lower hinge. This detail led the police to believe that Sheil, while standing in the bath, might have slipped and instinctively tried to grab onto the cabinet door, causing the hinge to give way under her weight. A bit later, in the late morning, at approximately 11 o'clock, the forensic team arrived at the scene. It was still the Christmas season, and there were toys of the couple's two children scattered around, which complicated the work of the forensic experts. They were present to ensure that there were no break-ins at the residence, or any signs of a struggle which could change the narrative. As they examined the front door, no evidence in this direction was discovered. There were also no signs of a struggle, indicating that no one had resisted in this place or had been forcibly taken to a room in the apartment, further convincing the investigators that Shield's death was accidental. To confirm this, they then talked to the family members. It had not been Rod who first discovered Shield lying in the bathtub, but their nine-year-old daughter, and she was the first to be questioned by the police. Of course, the child was still shaken by the sight of her mother in that water stained with her blood. Sheil Colvin had always lived in the Upper West Side, where her Orthodox Jewish family had settled decades ago. She had grown up within this close-knit community, despite the vastness of New York, and eventually, everyone had known more or less everyone in this corner of the city. Her childhood, adolescence, and the early years of her adulthood were happy times for Sheil and her loved ones. She had faced no major challenges during her education. In fact, she had excelled, which had allowed her to earn a degree that qualified her for for a future position as a wealth manager. 
The young woman eventually joined the Swiss banking group UBS, specializing in wealth management. By the age of 36, Scheel had climbed the corporate ladder and had become a significant employee, managing fortunes worth several million dollars for her clients. Despite a successful professional career in one of the wealthiest cities in the United States, if not the world, happiness had not been quiet on the horizon. There was money and the love of her family, but she was still single, which had weighed on the woman who had also wished to have children like many of her peers. In February 1998, she had decided it was time to take matters into her own hands and signed up for a festive gathering where young Jewish singles came together to make a meaningful connection. It turned out to be a great idea as she met Rod Colvin, who was 25 years old at the time and also worked in the banking sector. Shields' decision to attend this event hadn't been driven by desperation, and the connection between her and Rod was so strong that they had fallen in love quickly. The 11-year age difference between them hadn't bothered either of them, and their chemistry was so powerful that within a few weeks, they decided to get married. While some may have considered their marriage a bit hasty, love was present, and sealing this union between them seemed logical for the couple who had ignored the naysayers trying to dissuade them. The future had proved them right. Everything had gone well between them. They were involved in their community, their love had endured, and their happiness had only increased with the arrival of two beautiful children, a daughter and a son. Everything came to an abrupt halt with Shield's tragic bathtub accident, ending her life. The police had no doubts about the circumstances. She had slipped, hit her head, and could not recover. The next step was the autopsy scheduled for the following day to determine the cause of death. However, an unexpected twist unfolded. The forensic team discovered there was no autopsy, leaving everyone baffled. The reason for this was unusual. The rabbi from Sheol's synagogue had arranged for a local organization to ensure a proper Orthodox Jewish burial. They were granted access to clean the scene, removing every trace of blood and bodily tissue. This rapid action was rooted in Orthodox Jewish beliefs that prohibit autopsies as they are seen as disrespectful to the deceased. The rabbi had convinced Shield's family to allow the organization to handle the burial. Despite no initial objections to an autopsy, the apparent accidental nature of Shield's death made the family consent to this alternative approach. In this way, within 24 hours, the 47-year-old woman was buried in front of hundreds of people who had come to pay their final respects. A few days after the death of their beloved daughter, Shield's parents had begun to doubt the cause of her death. An accident can happen to anyone, but to die after slipping in a bathtub had certainly been unusual. The private detectives had stepped in and visited Shield's family to talk to various members. Naturally, they had first inquired about the relationship between Rod and Shield, given that they were separated, which they had found to be an interesting context to explore. In 2008, as their 10th marriage anniversary approached, trouble began to brew between the couple. Rod's behavior was at the heart of the deterioration. He experienced professional instability, frequently changing jobs. Moreover, he delved into gambling, leading to addiction, and his spending on backgammon soared to alarming levels, both financially and emotionally. He even traveled abroad for backgammon tournaments. Adding to this, he spent countless sleepless nights playing backgammon online. The decline was inevitable, worsening their relationship. During his trips, Rod engaged in extramarital affairs in different cities, betraying his marriage vows. Suspecting infidelity, Sheil began investigating her husband's emails, discovering his unfaithfulness. Upon confirming the infidelity, Sheil took quick action, understanding that her marriage was irrevocably damaged by Rod's selfish behavior. Sheil obtained a religious divorce but remained legally married in the eyes of New York. The legal divorce process was initiated by Sheil. They lived separately during this period, with Rod moving to a different apartment down the hallway. Despite tensions, they maintained a friendly facade for the sake of their children. However, there were concerns among Sheil's family that Rod displayed anger issues and might have been spying on her, retaining a key to her apartment and possibly even installing a surveillance camera in the building's hallway. These were observations made to private detectives hired by Shields' family. Despite these concerns, the question remained, did Rod commit a crime, and if so, how could he have done it without concrete evidence? 
After collecting this information, the private investigators went to work. Their initial task was to assess whether there was any unusual circumstance or if it was simply a case of a grieving family's judgment being clouded by the tragic event. To do this, they decided to pay a visit to Shields' apartment. However, they faced a challenge as the apartment was sealed shut. They needed permission, which they subsequently sought from a court, and after it was granted, they were supervised by the New York police as they prepared to examine the residence. While they had possession of the keys, they encountered difficulties. When they stood before the door, the lock appeared to be temperamental and reluctant to open. As another door opened in the hallway, Rod Colvin appeared. Claiming to have heard the commotion, he swiftly unlocked Shields' apartment door for the police and detectives. This raised questions about Rod's awareness and his ability to unlock the door. Inside, the detectives searched for Shields' missing phone which had prompted the investigation. They discovered her charger but couldn't find the phone, adding to the mystery. Their focus then turned to the bathroom where Sheil died. Examining a torn hinge, they doubted it could have happened accidentally due to the force required. This led to discussions about the possibility of homicide, even though there were no prior signs of foul play. To determine the truth, an autopsy was suggested, but the family faced a dilemma. Exhuming the body was discouraged by their Orthodox Jewish faith, leading to a heated debate with religious representatives advocating against it. The family of Sheil took their time before making a decision, but they wanted to know the truth. Eventually, they authorized the exhumation of her body. However, it hadn't been as straightforward as it seemed. There was a process involved, and despite the family's permission, a special warrant was required, which had taken three months to be granted. Sheil's body had finally been unearthed, and the autopsy had been conducted. The results were chilling. The young woman had died of asphyxiation after a particularly brutal strangulation that had broken the bones in her neck. It was officially confirmed that no accident had occurred in that apartment. It had indeed been a murder. The results of this autopsy were crucial because the New York City Police Department resumed the investigation and there were new elements being examined, including phone records and bank statements, things that wouldn't have been relevant in the case of an accident but were essential in a murder investigation. The investigators began questioning not only family members, but also anyone who were in contact with Rod or Sheil, including babysitters, housekeepers, and Sheil's divorce attorney. It was with the attorney that they had discovered the chaotic situation in which the couple had found themselves. In May 2009, a preliminary hearing took place before a judge. Rod had expressed that he couldn't afford to pay alimony to his ex-wife, claiming he was unemployed and had no savings. The judge's ironic comment about Rod giving up his backgammon games triggered his furious response towards Sheil, exposing him as vengeful. He even went to the extent of making false allegations against Sheil, accusing her of drug use, embezzlement, and child abuse, leading to an investigation. No evidence supported these allegations, and it was revealed that Rod had coached their young son to make discrediting statements about his mother. In July 2007, a significant court decision prevented prevented Rod from being alone with his children, and he lost custodial rights even after Shields' death. A social worker managed the children's transition to Rod's parents, which frustrated him greatly. During the investigation, it was discovered that Shield had a keratin hair treatment on December 30th, which was expensive and came with strict instructions to avoid moisture, heat, or steam, meaning no baths or showers. This raised questions about why Shield might have disregarded these instructions. Although investigators believed she didn't take a bath on the day of her death, it was not direct evidence and insufficient for criminal charges. Moreover, the investigation had shifted its focus to Rod as the detectives aimed to prove his guilt. Sheil and Rod were not officially divorced at the time of her death, with Sheil having a $5.2 million life insurance policy naming Rod as the beneficiary. The most incriminating detail emerged when it was revealed that Sheil had scheduled an appointment with her lawyer on the day of her death to remove Rod as the beneficiary, providing a compelling motive for the crime, money, specifically the $5 million, at stake. Investigators had seized the funds and were racing to establish Rod Colvin's involvement. Notably, Rod had known about Shields' lawyer appointment, raising suspicions of spying on his wife. Simultaneously, detectives reviewed surveillance footage from their apartment building, noting Rod leaving unusually early at 4 a.m. and his interaction with the doorman, 
possibly an attempt to create an alibi, Shields returned home the previous evening alone and on the phone drew attention. The missing phone, presumed to have spyware installed, remained elusive but crucial. Challenges in the case included no witnesses, lack of direct evidence, electronic device cleaning, and the fading of potential evidence over time due to the crime scene's cleaning. As time passed, building a strong case against Rod became increasingly difficult, erasing initial forensic evidence like DNA, fingerprints, and fibers. Now, it has been five years since the case was opened, with no arrests made. Despite suspicions surrounding him, this highlighted the limitations of the justice system when evidence was lacking in a murder case, even if the suspect had seemed obvious. They had now reached the summer of 2014. The phone at the police station rang, and a woman asked to speak to the detectives in charge of the Shield Colvin case. To their surprise, it was Deborah Oles on the line who had told them that she needed to talk to them. This was a significant turn of events and might finally shift the investigation in favor of the police. A few months earlier, Deborah Oles and Rod broke up. She presented herself before the detectives, ready to share her insights over the course of three days. Rod confided in her regarding his plans concerning the custody of their children. However, his motivation wasn't paternal love, but rather a desire for money. The inheritance remained under sequestration for five years, as Rod was still considered a suspect in Shield's murder, a status determined by the prosecutor. Shield, being prudent, had set aside money for her children. This was something Rod didn't have access to because he had no custody of his son and daughter. This was what drove him to take action to regain custody and control of the money. He was willing to do anything to get his hands on the inheritance. Deborah Oles had explained the vile plan he intended to execute. He planned to convince his daughter to stage a false rape using a cucumber, which he would then blame on his own father, Rod's father, and have him sent to prison, ultimately allowing Rod to regain custody of the children. The police were greatly aided by Deborah Oles, who had possessed evidence to support her claims. Throughout those years, she had realized she was dealing with a psychopath. Therefore, she gathered as much evidence as possible for the investigators on hard drives while waiting for the men to lose interest in her. She was scared for her life and decided to approach the authorities after he left. In those hard drives, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of conversations between Rod and various people. The investigators had needed to sift through gigabytes of data to finally put Rod Colvin behind bars, provided that the ultimate evidence was in his files. In those conversations, the police had found something interesting, even crucial. In a discussion with a backgammon acquaintance, Rod had explained that he had the keys to Shelley's apartment and could enter at any time. Those hard drives were a real treasure trove for the police, who had recovered hundreds of relevant pieces of information for the investigation. In 2013, they even discovered that Rod had conspired against his own daughter to make her take the blame for her mother's murder. The child had an email address, so her father had apparently logged into it to compose an email as if it was from his daughter in which she would confess to Shield's murder. Posing as his daughter, he had written the following lines, I lied, she hadn't just slipped. That day we had argued about her appointment. I had gotten angry, so I had pushed her. The water had started turning red. I had tried to lift her head, and she had remained still. Thankfully, after extensive data collection, law enforcement at last amassed a compelling case to indict Rod Colvin for the homicide of his wife, Sheil Colvin. On November 1, 2015, Rod was apprehended. However, the road to a conviction remained challenging as the evidence was primarily circumstantial, leaving room for a skilled defense attorney to potentially sow doubt within the jury's deliberations. However, while the suspect was in prison awaiting his trial, he had allegedly confessed to another inmate that he had murdered his wife and had even demonstrated how he had strangled her. The police had then requested the surveillance footage and it was possible to see Rod mimicking the act of strangulation, which were consistent with the autopsy results. Rod Colvin's trial finally started and had lasted for seven consecutive weeks, during which the jury had heard about all the horrors this man was capable of, from murdering his wife to contemplating the murder of his parents and plotting against his own children. In March 2019, the trial had come to an end, 
and it took the jury two days to deliberate before delivering the final verdict. Rod Colvin was found guilty of murder, although premeditation wasn't proven. This was justified by the lack of direct evidence implicating him in his wife's murder. He was sentenced to a minimum of 25 years in prison. Without Deborah Olz's intervention, this man would probably never have seen the inside of a prison. Moreover, he might have committed another murder for the sake of money. Share your opinions and insights on the matter in the comment section below. Thank you for listening and don't forget to follow for more crime stories.